Well, good morning. We're in Colossians chapter 2 this morning. If you were here uh, last week, you know we were in a psalm. And we were in a psalm because so many of you weren't here last week. You were at the uh, retreat, the family camp. I was able to be there for Friday evening and uh, Saturday morning and much of Saturday. It was an excellent camp, well attended. Jeff, thank you. A lot of work went into that, and Jeff did an excellent job. Uh, we need to do it again next year, and if we do, you need to be there. It was a great time of fellowship and great time of instruction from Mike Black. But I thought because there's so many that were there, we'd take a break from Colossians and then get back in it this morning, which we are. We're going to look at chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. <clears throat> Paul writes... For I want you to know how great a struggle I have on your behalf, and for those who are at Laodicea, and for all those who have not personally seen my face, that their hearts may be encouraged, having been knit together in love, and attaining to all the wealth that comes from the full assurance of understanding, resulting in a true knowledge of God the true knowledge of God's mystery, that is, Christ Himself, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I say this so that no one will delude you with persuasive argument. For even though I am absent in body, nevertheless I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good discipline and stability of your faith in Christ." May the Lord bless this reading of His Word and bless our time of studying it together. Let's pray. A really big thing happened one morning in the hills above Sacramento when the foreman at Sutter's Mill saw a sparkle in the stream. He took the yellow flakes in his hands, studied them for a moment, and knew what he had. Excited, he ran to his crew and said, Gold, boys, gold. That began the California gold rush. Paul had a similar message, but he had gold of a different kind and of a higher value than anything dug out of the ground. He calls it the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. It is found in Christ, he says, and every Christian has access to it. It's ours. That's what he tells the Colossians and us in Colossians chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. We are rich, the richest people on the planet. Through Christ, we have the revelation of God, life-changing knowledge. It is better than gold dust or shares of apple. You question that. Well, the psalmist didn't. More than once, they tell us that the law, the Word of God, His revelation is more precious than gold. Yes, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey. It's quite a claim. We know gold. It's solid. It's reliable. In 1849, Americans in the thousands left everything to go west and make their fortune. Men will risk all they have for a sack of gold. But according to Paul and the psalmists, we have something more valuable and practical than bars of bullion. It is spiritual riches that give a sound mind and a productive life the best life. But again, do you believe that? Paul was so convinced of the value of these treasures, he said, are hidden in Christ, that he traveled far and he suffered much to make them known to the churches. He spoke of this in chapter 1, of all the sacrifices for the saints that he had made. He He didn't uh, do it in his own strength, he says. He he did it 
the, diffi the difficulties of it. He did the striving, he said, according to God's power working within him. It was a supernatural thing. He, he says that, but Paul did it. He labored, he suffered, and he did it because he loved the saints. He wanted them to know the riches they had so, he would, so they would mine them, they would dig them, they would live them. It was a labor, a labor of love on Paul's part. And he wanted the Colossians to know that. That's how he begins chapter 2. He wanted them to know how great a struggle he had on their behalf because of his love for them. Now remember, he didn't know them. That's what he says. He says that they had never seen his face, and yet he put up a, a great struggle for them and for those in Laodicea, in Laodicea, another city in the Lycus Valley near Colossae. Now that's very instructive, I think. Very instructive about love. It's more than words. It's more than feelings. It's action. And Paul's actions were serious. They were agony. That's the word that he uses here. This word struggle has the idea of agony. It's based on that word. It's the kind of effort athletes like wrestlers give. It's all out. And Paul gave the Colossians and Laodiceans that kind of effort because he loved them, even though he never met them. He struggled for them when he labored in and around Ephesus to give the gospel, and people like Epaphras received it and then went to Colossae and Laodicea and evangelized. So through the missionaries that went to the Lycus Valley, Paul became the spiritual father of the saints there. He felt a connection to them. He labor, his, his labors in Ephesus were for them as much as for anyone. But his struggles for them continued long after his great Asian ministry ended, even into the Roman jail where he wrote to them in chains. His letter was a labor for them, again, a labor of love. He had to think carefully about their situation, think about the false teachers that threatened their faith, think about the nature of the heresy they were dealing with and how to correct it and how to give the best defense against it. That took labor, intellectual mental labor. He did that because they weighed heavily on his mind. And he spoke of that, spoke of that indirectly at least, in 2 Corinthians 11, where he speaks about all that he had done, all that he had ex experienced in, in giving the gospel, taking it to the Gentiles, the physical hardships that he went through. But it wasn't just physical hardships. He also speaks of, of the, the daily pressure that he felt for, due to the concern that he had for all of the churches. And that included these Colossians and the Laodiceans. He had a concern for them. And so he prayed for them. He could do that in, in jail. And no doubt he did it daily and he did it earnestly. He bore them on his heart. And it, it weighed on him constantly. But love not only has feeling and action... It has direction. And Paul gives the purpose of his concern, gives the direction of his concern and his labors in verse 2, where he gives three goals for his instruction to them. He wanted them to be encouraged in the faith. He wanted them to have assurance in the truth. And third, he wanted them to be grounded in the truth about Christ. He wanted them to have the truth of Christ fully and correctly. So his first goal here was to have their hearts encouraged, having been knit together in love. Love is key. Love is important. Error had come into that church. It no doubt had caused some confusion, some disruption. They needed to be strengthened and encouraged in their faith by their love for each other. Love would give them assurance in the truth because it's a demonstration that the faith 
that Christian truth, that the Christian life is real and alive. Paul has explained that his ministry was to make known to the Gentiles the mystery which he defined in chapter 1 as Christ in you. Christ lives within them, he's saying, as he lives within us. He lives in us through the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, and he wanted them to understand that. He labored for that. He prayed for that. Now, for us, that requires uh, study. It requires learning. It requires effort. But not just that. The Christian life is not just knowledge, but also action. It involves deeds of love. It involves concern. And that must be experienced to really fully learn and know the truth. And so Paul was urging them to take a personal interest in each other and improve their brotherly love. Through that, they would strengthen one another, they would encourage one another, and also they would confirm the truth of the Christian life. Paul was an example of doing that. He didn't know them personally. They had never met. And yet, he struggled mightily for them to bless them, to, to strengthen them, and to defend them. He did that because he and they were knit together spiritually. That's what he speaks of in, in verse 2, having been knit together in love. They were joined together spiritually. They, they were part of the body of Christ. And they could not help because of that but have a concern for one another. It's natural in our spiritual family to have a concern for one another. Now, if he had that concern, having never met them, yet loved them and sacrificed for them, how much more should they, who knew each other, love each other and care for each other? That's a normal, healthy church. But it's also necessary because through the experience of brotherly love, family love, Christians experience the love and the life of Christ. And, and this is a priority with the apostles. For example, you read all through 1 John. Statements like, little children, let us not love with word or with tongue, but in deed and truth. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. Where did John get that? Well, from the same source Paul got it, from the Lord himself. This is my commandment, that you love one another just as I have loved you. Well, how did he love us? He loved us unconditionally sacrificially. And it's as we understand His love for us, the love of God for sinners, it's then that we want to love one another, that we want to do what Paul did. We want to sacrifice our lives for our brothers and sisters. That's love, not sentimentality. In fact, Paul explained previously in chapter 1, verse 28, that he taught, and he admonished, he gave truth, he gave the whole truth, he corrected people. Love doesn't ignore errors or failures. A person who really loves others will be honest and give correction where that is necessary. Now, there's a right way to do that, and that right way is tactfully. The proverb says, a gentle tongue can break a bone. Well, that's wisdom, and that takes care, and that takes patience, that takes skill. But love corrects, as well as cheers, as well as encourages. Now, here's the point. It's as we do that and experience it, have love for one another and receive love for one another, that we get a truer understanding of Christ. He's not only a story from a book. 
He is concrete. He is real. He is alive. The mystery of Christ in us is not just an idea. It's an experience. As the New Testament scholar F.F. Bruce wrote, the revelation of it, the revelation of this mystery, cannot be properly known apart from the cultivation of brotherly love. When we see theology in action, when we see faith in action, we get a fuller understanding of biblical truth. We see Christ alive in the love of the saints because it is His life in us and lived through us. It is, it is a demonstration of the very thing Paul is talking about, Christ in us. We see His life in the reality of it. And again, that leads to the second goal, assurance. Paul wanted all Christians to be firm in the faith. We cannot progress in the faith if our, our minds are clouded with doubt. We cannot progress in the faith if we're not assured in it. So he urged both truth and love. Doctrine is lived. It's not just in the mind. It has to be there to begin with, but it has to be lived. That gives assurance of the truth, assurance in the faith. And that leads to Paul's third goal for them, and, and that is that they have a true knowledge of God's mystery, that is, Christ. The mystery was defined earlier in chapter 1 as Christ in you. Here, the emphasis is on the person of Christ. We need to know Him. We need to know all about Him. We need to know who He is and what He has done. Paul was telling the Colossians to have a knowledge of the real Christ, not the Christ of the heretics. Whatever they taught, they, they taught that He was not sufficient. They denied His deity. He was only one helper on the path to enlightenment and to God. He was only one of many mediators. Paul was praying that the Colossians and the church down through the centuries would know the true Christ. He's not less than God. He is God, God the Son. He is sufficient. He is the only mediator between God and man the only bridge between heaven and earth, and He is the key to knowledge. He's the key to understanding the Word of God. Now, He Himself said that. In John chapter 5 and verse 39, He was in a hostile confrontation with some of the Jews, probably the Pharisees. And He said to them, You search the Scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. It is these that testify about me. If you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. Now that's a very significant statement. A significant statement in a number of ways, but certainly in terms of understanding the Bible and how to interpret it. Because what he's saying is, he's at the center of it. The Old Testament is all about Christ. You will never understand it if you don't see him as its subject. He's the subject of the Old Testament. He's the subject of the New Testament from the beginning to the end. It's about Christ. And Paul says in verse 3, you will never have the treasures if you don't know Him. They are in Him. In whom? In Christ are hidden all the treasures, he says. If people had left everything to get gold in California and had gone to Los Angeles instead of Sacramento, they would have found nothing but palm trees and movie stars. Not really. They would have gone to the wrong place if they want gold. And the same is true here. Paul says all the treasures are hidden in Christ. So where do we go to find the treasures? Well, the world points us in all directions, but what Paul says is there's only one direction, there's only one place, that's Jesus Christ. Now, what does he mean when he says they're hidden in Christ? Well, he doesn't mean they're concealed. He doesn't mean hidden in a, a literal sense, but laid up or treasured up. 
They are, they are there waiting for us. All the treasures. We are rich with lasting treasures. There is an old movie, a classic, The Treasure of Sierra Madre. It's as old as I am. So I don't think I'll ruin the ending of it for you if you haven't seen it. But it's about a miner who leads a couple of inexperienced partners to a vein of gold in the mountains of Mexico. They mine the gold and fill their bags with gold dust. They're rich. That's when their troubles began with greed, distrust, and finally loss. In the end, all the gold blows away back to the mountain. It's really a morality play that that shows the uncertainty of riches and the vanity of pursuing them. That's not where happiness lies. Even Hollywood can get that right. And that's what Paul warns of in in 1 Timothy chapter 6, that people who want to get rich with the, the treasures of this world fall into temptations and a snare and are plunged into ruin and destruction. That's not so with these riches. What Paul calls all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. This is what we should want. This is what we should seek. They they only bless. They increase our fulfillment in life and for eternity. They are the knowledge of God and man in the Scriptures. It is what we need to study and believe. And for these Colossians, as well as for us, it would enable them and us to discern truth and error. Last week, or two weeks ago, I quoted Calvin and the Institutes, which he began at the first line of that work is nearly all the wisdom we possess consists of two parts. The knowledge of God and of ourselves. And then later he writes, it is certain that man never achieves a clear knowledge of himself unless he has first looked upon God's face and then descends from contemplating Him to scrutinize himself. Now that's only logical. We need to look at the Creator to understand ourselves as the creature. We need to look at His perfections to understand our flaws and how far short we fall. So that's true. There is no study more edifying and more profitable than the study of God. Charles Spurgeon said that, and this is a statement that I've read more than once because I think it's quite profound. It's in a sermon that he preached dated January 7th, 1855. And he said, There is something exceedingly improving to the mind in the contemplation of the divinity. No subject more humbles the mind than thoughts of God. But while the the subject humbles the mind, it also expands it. It enlarges the intellect. It comforts the soul. Nothing calms us during trials or gives us peace in sorrow like musing on the subject of the Godhead. He said that as he began his ministry in London when he was 20 years of age. Now that's a great deal of wisdom for a man of 20 to have. But what it shows is is he had fed deeply upon the Word of God. He studied the Scriptures And they changed him. They gave him wisdom and knowledge. That's what Paul was praying for the Colossians, that they would have this, that they would do this, that they would seek that, and and that Christians down through the ages would do that. Get their riches. It's It's greater than the wealth of nations. It is wisdom and knowledge. Money can't buy that. But we Christians have... Free access to it now. We we can know things that men can only speculate on. Men, brilliant men, 
speculate on so much about the universe and about man, about the future, and get it wrong so much of the time. We have access to the revelation. We have access to the truth. We don't speculate. We understand what God has revealed to us. We know God. And we can learn His character and attributes, His works and glory. And we know Him by studying Christ. He is the image of the invisible God, Paul said earlier in chapter 1. He is God the Son. We see God's attributes in Christ as we look at Him. We see God's power over creation. We see His power over the elements and over the devil. God's compassion for the sick is seen in our Lord. His compassion for the needy. His holiness. Christ is the sinless Son of God. He is righteous. And we learn from Him what the nature of the Godhead is. He stilled the storm on the sea. Cast out evil spirits. He healed the sick. We see God's power in Him. But we also see the grace of God exhibited in His Son. And what we learn from studying Christ is God is personal and God is faithful. The God who gives promises is able to keep them. In fact, it is impossible for Him not to keep His promises. It's impossible for Him to fail us. Paul learned that from the beginning of his Christian life when Christ spoke to him on the road to Damascus. He learned it all the way to the end of his life when he stood trial before Caesar. In his final book, he told Timothy in 2 Timothy 4 that at his trial, no one supported him. They all deserted him. Imagine that. The apostle who brought the gospel to the Gentiles, who suffered and struggled for them, was concerned for them day and night, and prayed for them daily, was deserted by them. But he said, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me, so that through me the proclamation might be fully accomplished and all the Gentiles might hear. That included Nero himself. The Lord God, the triune God, is personal. He is faithful. He stands with us when others don't. He strengthens us when we are weak. All the apostles learned that as the saints have down through the ages. As they walk by faith and find themselves in a difficult spot, they find God faithful. So, know Christ... That's Paul's counsel. He opens up all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge to all who do. He has given believers a new mind. He has given us a new orientation. He has given us the ability to understand Scripture and to live it, to be obedient. Through God's Word, we learn the, the fundamental truths and principles of life, our, our origin and destiny, where we came from, where we're going. We have knowledge of the world and human nature and God's plan for it all. We know these things. The world doesn't. We have access to all that knowledge. We have no access to the knowledge of the ultimate th end of all things. Paul called it the hope of glory. That's the ultimate end for God's people. And that hope gives us courage as well uh, to live a life well in this world. And it takes courage to do that because we face challenges. But to know what we have, to know what is before us, to know the end of all things, the hope of glory, that gives encouragement to stand firm. That was the encouragement that the writer of the Hebrews gave to them. He was writing to a group of people who were weak and suffering from the challenges that they were facing. And so he reminds them of earlier days and how they stood firm against great challenges. They suffered much. They suffered the loss of their property for their faith. And they were able to do that willingly, joyfully, because he said they had 
a better possession, a lasting one. Well, that's what they knew. They knew that these things are temporal, that everything is passing away. This life is short. Even the longest of lives is lived briefly. They knew that, and they were able to let go of everything with the knowledge of what lay ahead. That gives wisdom in life, living life with the the knowledge of heaven and the world to come before us. We have all of that in the Word of God. Well, that's the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, and how can we fully explain it in the few minutes that we have or in a single sermon? This great expression, the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Well, of course we can't, but I think we can sum it up in one word. Scripture. That's it. The treasures of wisdom and knowledge. You're all familiar, I'm sure, with the five slogans of the Protestant Reformation, the solas, the five onlys, as they are called. Grace alone, faith alone, Christ alone, glory to God alone. But the first of the five is, I would say, the first among equals. And it's Scripture alone. The Bible is the fully inspired, inerrant Word of God, and it is our standard. It is our authority. That's the meaning of Scripture alone. It's our sole authority for faith and practice. Without it, we cannot know anything with any certainty. We cannot know the truth of the other solas, the other onlys. We can't know if they're true or not. We can only know that by the Word of God. We begin with it. We begin with Scripture and faith in it. But we can never understand it, never understand the Bible, if we don't first believe what it says about Christ. He's the keystone to Scripture. Remove Him and the whole arch of the Bible collapses. The whole structure of the Bible collapses. So we must study it through Him. And that's a lifetime of study. But He offers us all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Why would we not want to know Him? And why would we not want to have that? I ask that almost rhetorically because the fact is we have other things that interest us in life, don't we? We are easily distracted. I'm not against entertainment. I'd be a hypocrite if I said I was. I I, uh, was in the midst of study last night when I set it aside and went and watched a college football game. And we lost. So that's my repayment for... that's not a bad thing to have entertainment. I'm not suggesting that. But here's here's the problem. Often we miss the best while entertaining ourselves to death, to use the title of a popular book in the 1980s. We're distracted to our own poverty and peril because the knowledge of the Lord leads to knowing Him better, and that knowledge is transforming. He causes changes in us. He makes us better. We are transformed as we see Him in the Word of God and study Him. But the knowledge of Him and His Word also protects us in a deceptive and dangerous world where the enemy is constantly on the attack and seeking to draw us into his web of lies and tears. That's why Paul informs us of our great treasure here. He informs us of that so that we will avoid those traps and those dangers. That's what he says next. He explains the purpose here in verse 4. He didn't want them to be misled by persuasive argument. That phrase actually means persuasive false argument. It's an argument that seems plausible, but is untrue. But that's true of all effective error. It's persuasive. It even uses the Bible to make its its, uh, argument. So how do we counter that? We counter it with Scripture. 
We counter it with the truth. That's what Paul is saying. The best way to defeat error is with the truth. It's by knowing God's Word. There's no better example of that than our Lord Himself. He was tempted in the wilderness by the devil. Satan tried to catch Christ with Scripture. His temptations were all veiled in Bible verses. Each time Jesus answered him with a Bible verse out of the book of Deuteronomy. When's the last time you read the book of Deuteronomy? That's an important book. They all are. But that's the one that the Lord used to deal with the devil. He countered the lie with truth. That's the way to overcome error. But of course, to do that, we must know the Scriptures. And to know the Scriptures, we have to spend time in them. We have to set aside some things we might like to do to do this, to read and study the Word of God. And that's what Paul was urging. And he was doing that with all the support that he could give, all of the effort that he could give. He wrote in verse 5, For even though I am absent in body, nevertheless I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good discipline and the stability of your faith in Christ. He was in a Roman jail. He was in chains. He couldn't be there in Colossae with them to, to face the enemy face to face. But his thoughts and his prayers were with them earnestly and genuinely. And he could encourage them as he did here. They were doing well, he says, showing good discipline and stability. And that's what the Word of God gives. Gives stability in thought and conduct. They had that because of their faith in Christ. They knew the Gospel, believed it, and were joined to Christ, placed in Him like a, like a branch in a vine. They had life in them. They were truly joined with Christ and He was in them. But that's just the beginning. The Gospel is the beginning. We need to grow from that. We need to develop in that. And we have the means to do that. We have in Christ all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. We need to know how rich we are. What we have. And we need to get it. We need to mine the treasures. We need to dig them up. They are life-changing riches. Not long ago, I read about the discovery in Egypt in 1922 of Pharaoh Tutankhamun's tomb, King Tut, the most famous discovery in the history of archaeology. Howard Carter found it. His first look inside the vault happened when he put a lighted candle through a small opening that he'd made in a sealed door. Behind him was the Earl of Carnivon, who had financed the expedition. The Earl was impatient. This had been five years in waiting, and now they've discovered something. And so he was pulling on Carter's coat, coat saying, what do you see? What do you see? Carter answered almost breathlessly, I see wonderful things. And those things have fascinated people for almost a hundred years the treasures of Egypt. Carter later wrote of that moment when he looked into the tomb, I was struck dumb with amazement. Gold, he said, everywhere the glint of gold. Here's what's so interesting. He had searched the Valley of the Kings for five years trying to find that tomb and was about to give up when he dug one last time. He dug on the hill where they were camped, where they had camped every year for five years. He was sitting on the treasures of Egypt the whole time and didn't know it. Isn't that like us? We need to encourage each other to dig for our riches. We encourage one another to do that by loving one another. That shows the reality of our faith, which results in assurance and knowledge. Knowledge that is life-giving, life-changing. And it's right before us in this book. 
In Proverbs 8, wisdom is standing on the heights, standing by the way, standing in the street, and inviting people to listen to her. It's, it's there to be heard. It's there to be read. It's there to place in our heart noble things, right things, she says. I am understanding, she says. Power is mine. Do you want power? Do you want self-control? It's here. We don't have to search the world for wisdom. We don't have to dig down into the depths of the earth or scale the heights of heaven to find wisdom. It's right here. Right before each and every one of us. It's in this book. But wisdom also says... All those who hate me love death. So may God teach us to love wisdom and knowledge. As Paul said, it is hidden in Christ. It is laid up in Christ for believers. If you've not believed in Him, then it actually is hidden from you because it seems foolish to you. Understand, that's foolish. The Word of God, the Gospel of life is near you. It's in these words. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. That's all. Simply believe in Him. Receive Him and His sacrifice for your sins, for, for the forgiveness of all of that, and for the righteousness that He imputes. That is wise. May God give you that wisdom. May God help you to do that and give to you and give to all of us here a desire for His truth and treasures. Why don't we end with hymn number 23 in the Songs of Praise book, Before the Throne, and remain standing for the benediction. Hymn number 23. What a great truth that is, Father, that every believer in Christ is one with Him and we are hid with Him on high. We are safe and secure. We face difficulties in this life. We, challenge, we face challenges with the truth, face error and deception, and we face physical danger at times. We live in a difficult, fallen world, and yet we know we are hid with Christ, and we are secure. Thank you for that. Give us a deeper understanding of Him, of His work for us, of His person, of your whole counsel, that we might know the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. We thank you for giving us access to them in your Son. It's in His name we pray. Amen.